I'm here to talk today a little bit about weeds and wildlife and its effects. And I'm going to run through quite a bit of um, statistics, and I hope I can figure out how to work this thing correctly. Hey, it works. That's great. Um, so I love to teach, and I, I can tell you this right now, I love to teach third and fourth grade, and so that's what I typically do. And, and so um, a lot of my slides are going to be geared towards them because I like to have pictures. So it's pretty small up there, but what four components do animals need to survive? Food. Food, water, shelter. There's one more. Oxygen is true, but that's not the fourth one. The, the kids stumped me this weekend with that one as well. But they need space as well. So you've got food, water, shelter, and space. And so those are kind of the four things that we're going to look at today. And specifically, I want you to think about those things as I talk and how all these different things are going to play into that. Okay. So what's that picture of down in the corner? Yes, I, I, I try to make this easy for you. It's leafy spurge because that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, but weeds end up decreasing wildlife habitat, which affects all of those four components. And that is one of the biggest things that at Parks and Wildlife that we are concerned about is habitat. If we decrease habitat, we're automatically decreasing the amount of wildlife that can be sustained in that area. And, and you could also say, too, that with your crops, if, if you know, if, if you don't have any crops, you're also decreasing wildlife as well because they come and feed off your crops. And yes, that does happen. Um, but the biggest thing is going to be decrease in habitat. So also, what weeds will do is they will increase the soil erosion by wind and water. And that causes a huge effect when it comes to wildlife. Because the more erosion that we have, the less habitat we have, right? Okay, so this is one little fun fact I found, that leafy spurge can decrease the carrying capacity by up to 50%. That's pretty big, okay? So let's look at the big picture. Earth has about 33 billion acres, and only 10% of that is suitable for growing crops. Okay, yes, I'm here to talk about wildlife, but we gotta start with crops a little bit. If you reduce the 10% by, um, by millions of acres infested with weeds, and the land available for fruit production decreases significantly, okay? So, you know, you've gotta think about it in, in that realm. And this doesn't account for all of the other things, the insects, the animals, the diseases the weather and other methods, okay? And these agricultural crops that are constantly monitored versus what we have out in the wild habitat, which is much less monitored. So think of it in that realm. What you can watch on your property and see and know what's happening, we don't always necessarily know what's happening out in the wild because we just can't always see it. We don't have enough people to watch over it. When you look at Parks and Wildlife in itself, I'm a district wildlife manager. Um, I can tell you right now that I don't get to do a lot of biology. I don't get to do a lot of property management either. But our property technicians do, and there's not very many of them throughout the um, state of Colorado. And they're going to be specifically looking at properties that we own. So like Dome Rock State Wildlife Area, Rama, things of that nature, uh, Flagler, Hugo. And so it's a lot smaller area that they're going to be looking at and have time to actually go and spend time on it and see what's going on. But they do a great job. They spray for weeds all the time, and they're fixing fences and things like that. <clears throat> I apologize, this is really small. When I was looking at it on my computer, I could read it. So <laughs> if you can't read it, I'm sorry, but uh, we will go over it. So weeds can survive in the soil for many years. Bindweed, I hate bindweed. It's in my yard. Oh, it's horrible. I pull it up and I kill it whenever I can. But that thing will last for about 30 years or more. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm that old that it could last in my yard for the rest of my life. And, and I don't want to see it. I don't ever want to see it again. But it is so restrictive. Um, I lived at a house where we had bindweed, and I didn't know what it was when it first started coming in, so I let it grow. And then I couldn't get rid of it. Um, and so now I know. Every time I see a little bit of it, I pull it out or, or kill it. But think about how that's going to have effect on wildlife, too. When it's out there in, in a state where we don't see it and we can't kill it, this is something that's going to outcompete other native things that wildlife want to eat. Um, weeds that have traits that allow them to outcompete native vegetation, so they grow earlier in the spring, right? Okay, they're popping up now. We all see them in our yards. They're, they have more extensive root systems, again, back to that bindweed that we don't like. And then they have higher seed production. This is everything that you've heard already today. All the things that we fear and that we're fighting. They start growing, growing earlier in the spring and get a head start and they start utilizing and sucking up all of that water before the native plants can get to it. Again, that is just going to affect wildlife um, with us as well. 
And then, this, this one is, I, I apologize, but this is one of my favorites. Um, I grew up in Indiana, and we had a property that was completely infested with one of the mustard plants. And I wish I had a picture of it, because just what we went in there and did is we ran fire through it. Um, and we were looking at succession and how it was coming back in the future years. But mustard family, even though it's a weed, it, it was still kind of, it was kind of cool to see what was going on with it. But between the mustard family and the cheatgrass, it can germinate in the fall and winter and be ready to start coming up in the springtime. And again, what that's going to do is it's coming up earlier than all those native plants and out competing them for all the water and the nutrients that are out there. So, like we've been talking about already, it has more of an impact than just in the agricultural community. It's everywhere we go. Any place that we look, we've got weeds. You can re it can reduce the plant biodiversity, animals, insects, and microorganisms, and it can create these monocultures. So that, that monoculture that I was talking about with the mustard plant, it was completely encompassing about two or three acres, and that's all you would see. There was nothing else there. And this is undesirable habitat for native plants, animals, insects, and other microorganisms. Even if it's not a noxious weed, if you take an area and have it be just a monoculture, you are going to have a hard time finding animals that will live in that area because they can't find what they need. What do they need? Food, water, space, and shelter. Okay? So they have to have the food in order to be able to eat. They've got to have the water, which may or may not be there. And they also have to have the shelter in the space. And the shelter could be in the form of a canopy. Um, but they have to have that. And if they can't have that because of the monoculture, they're not going to be able to survive. It can also increase, these monocultures can increase wind and water erosion, which alters the water movement in the soil and the nutrient cycling. Again, just another effect. Weed infested areas also have a lot less organic matter. So I moved into a house about a year and a half ago and started a garden and it was very, very rocky. I, I don't know how I got anything to grow in there. Um, but I had the soil tested to see how much organic matter was in there. And there was pretty much nothing. So we started a compost pile, and that's how I'm trying to add back into that soil and, and see if I can get some more nutrients in there. But again, this is going to have effect on wildlife as well. If we can't get organic matter into the soil, um, that's going to have an effect too. And the weed-infested areas that have less organic matter do to increased erosion by the water and wind. It's all going back to water and wind, isn't it? These weeds. It also reduces water infiltration and availability to other plants, okay? So what are we looking at here? What's my picture? That's our napweed, right? So the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium can be reduced by 40 to 90% in spotted napweed in infested areas. It's pretty drastic, isn't it? Okay? So what other kind of effects are we having? It's also going to alter plant community <coughs> composition by reducing the forage. We know that. Decreasing the canopy and escape cover altering the water flow and availability, and reducing space avail available for wildlife. So we're affecting all four components again, everything that they need in order to have habitat. And these wildlife communities are altered as preferred vegetation is reduced. Okay? I love chocolate. That's my preferred vegetation. But I bet you with wildlife it's going to be something different. Okay? <coughs> but you have to think of it that way. You know, Think about what it is that they really want to go out and what they're seeking. And if they can't get it because weeds are infesting an area, they're going to move along. Noxious weeds can cause more extreme so soil temperatures due to the lower water levels, okay? Because why do we have lower water levels with noxious weeds? Because they're sucking it up. They're drinking it all up so it can't get to the native plants, okay? Exposure of the soil to sunlight because of the reduced canopy, right? Again, we're taking away shelter. And then also poor soil aggregation organic material content. Back to everything we've been talking about. They may have root systems that take longer to decompose than fibrous roots of grasses and forbs. So that's kind of interesting, too, is that a lot of these can stay in the soil a lot longer as well. And in riparian areas, native plants reduce stream bank erosion by absorbing and dissipating flood water. So the native plants are doing a great job of making sure the water is supposed to be where it is supposed to be. And also by filtering water along while providing wildlife habitat. Why do we need our streams? For the animals to drink from, okay, it provides habitat. It increases the, the differences of type, the variety of plants that we're going to have in the area, right? Because it's a riparian area. So all of those kinds of things. Now some weeds, tamarisk, that's one that we really try to target in our areas. 
It can utilize more water, thus reducing water available for wildlife, and, and we see that a lot. And I'll talk about tamarisk here in just a few minutes as well. Um, but that's one of our big ones, is that when we see tamarisk, we know that it's sucking up all of the water in the area and it's taken away from the plants that are in that area and possibly from wildlife. The picture is this. Yeah, this is Waldo. Um, so, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but some weeds have an aliopathic effect on the soil. So when plant parts ex exude a chemical that prevents other plants from growing in the area. I believe bindweed does that, but that just might be psychological because I don't like bindweed. Um, but also litter from these noxious weeds may leach compounds that inhibit germination of other seeds. Okay, so it's not just the fact that these weeds are in the area and that they're growing but it's the possibility that they're also leaching out into the soil and causing problems with growing the native plants that are out there. So tamarisk accumulates salt in the foliage and when that happens, it falls to the ground and is leached into the ground, making the soil extremely salty and hard for other plants to grow around it. So that's another reason that we don't like tamarisk as well. And then weeds alter other cycles as well, such as fires, and that has to do um, partly with the cheatgrass. And the native plants are not capable of surviving the more frequent or more intense fires. So fires can be good, but they can also be bad. And we've seen, seen that in, in many different circumstances. When I was a student, we ran a fire through a forest just to see what kind of variety we would get back afterwards. And the variety that came back in the, the plants was awesome. It was amazing. But also what I hear, too, is that it, it can be harder for those native plants to come back and to take hold and it's easier for the noxious weeds to come in. And so it can be a good, bad thing. If we can do it in an area where we can make sure that we have control of the noxious weeds, it can have an awesome, awesome effect and cause um, a lot more food to be available for the wildlife that's out there. And not only will you see a lot more flora out there, but you also see a lot more fauna. And that's, that's what we want. Cost of controlling weeds is not only a problem for farmers and ranchers. So this extends out from, from just that area. Cost in agriculture, control costs in agriculture and other areas are passed along to the consumer, the price of food and clothing and other things. Hunters, anglers, hikers, landscape contractors, building contractors, oil and gas industry, oil and gas industry is big for us right now, and other outdoor enthusiasts should know that they could spread the seed or the vegetable matter just by bringing you know, by walking through the area, driving vehicles or equipment through the area, that can pick it up. And that is a huge concern. And that's one of the things that with the gas and oil industry, um, especially on the western slope, that we have to be cognizant of. Not only is it possibly interrupting habitat for wildlife, but it's also possibly bringing in seeds that we don't want. Areas invaded by weeds are not as aesthetically pleasing. So when it comes to the park side of my job, in our parks, we want to make sure that we're drawing in visitors and that we're bringing people there. Well, part of it is because of the wildlife, but the other part is also because these parks are beautiful. If we have weeds in there, that's not going to happen, and that's going to be one of our other problems. A lot less variety of the flora and the fauna in the infested areas. And also, infestations in large parks and wilderness areas is much more difficult and more expensive for us to control because it's not something that we get to monitor every day. So how does this affect wildlife? So I picked black bears to talk about because it's one of my favorite subjects. They're the coolest things in the world, but they can still scare me. Um, and if you want to hear a funny story in a few minutes, I'll tell you about how a bear scared me because it's just fun. Um, so black bear issues. They live in or near forests that are abundant in fruit and nuts. About 90% of their diet consists of fruit, nuts, grasses, and berries. And a lot of that depends on the time of year. About this time of year, they're eating on grasses because they're coming out of hibernation. I, I say that loosely because it's not technically hibernation, it's actually torpor. They don't go through a true hibernation. But when I talk to third and fourth graders, it's the best thing for them to understand. So, um, so when they come out of torpor, they are going and they're feeding off the grasses right away. And a lot of that has to do with it is they have a fecal plug that they're trying to pass. And they have to get that fiber in there so that they can do that. And then the other 10% of their diet includes fish or other types of meat. Why would 90% of their diet be a veg vegetable or vegetation and things like that? It's what's available. Did you guys go out and make lunch today? No. Because it was easy, right? Somebody brought us lunch. It was great. We didn't have to do anything, right? 
It's fantastic. Okay, bears are fast but lazy. Um, <laughs> they know what they can eat and they know what doesn't move. And fruit, nuts, and grasses, and berries do not move, so they don't have to expend much energy in order to go after them. And why would they? I mean, they've, I mean look at them. They're round. Um, so that's why. And then in the fall, okay, this has to do with feeding as well, they go through a state of what's called hyperphagia, and that's when they're going to feed 20 hours out of the day. This is when you're going to see them more out during dusk and dawn and during the middle of the day and all that kind of stuff. And they consume about 15,000 to 20,000 calories a day just to, in order to make it through torpor. And this about makes me want to throw up when I read this. It's about 50 to 67 cheeseburgers a day. I can't even imagine trying to eat that much. That would just be horrible. So. But the amount a female, and I'm, I'm getting to the point here on the next slide, the amount a female eats in the fall determines whether or not she will become pregnant. So we're back to the four components again, okay? I'm talking about a lot about food with bears. If we have weeds in an area that are outcompeting native vegetation, the vegetation that they want to eat, this is really going to determine where these bears are going to be. Part of the reason that we have bears in urban areas is partly because of weeds. Other parts is going to be because lack of rain. Luckily, right now, we're getting a ton of rain, and I hope that throughout the rest of the spring, we will continue to do so. If we don't and it starts to dry up, we're going to have bear problems this summer. If we get an early frost, or I mean, not an early frost, but a late frost, if we get a frost right now, that's going to um, determine whether or not we're going to have bear problems as well. So if we can control the weeds, if we can control the rain, which we can't, and if we can control whether or not we have frost, which we can't either, that will help us to make sure that bears don't have problems. But I can tell you last summer alone, we had so many less bear calls than what we normally did because of the rain and the lack of frost. It was a wonderful summer. We couldn't believe it. I, there would be times I would check my cell phone just to make sure that it was on and that I didn't miss a call because I wasn't getting calls. It was great. But that's one thing to think about. And these bears, what they learned to do is they learned to feed on bird feeders, trash cans, barbecue grills, compost piles, gardens, livestock, and pets because they need what to survive? They need food, okay? So if they can't find it because weeds are out competing their native vegetation, then they are looking elsewhere, and that's exactly what they're doing. So I like this picture. This one is actually from the Springs area. I don't remember where. I think it was within the last two years. Um, so what also has helped the flora and the fauna in the area? We talked about this a little bit earlier. We talked about fires and how they can help. Um, we also know that they don't always help either. But it provides a greater variety of plant species, leads to greater variety of animal species, and also a healthier ecosystem. I have a landowner up in Black Forest. She called me about two months ago, and she said that she is putting in an apiary just specifically to help pollinate the, um, the plants in that area. And I thought that was an excellent, excellent idea. I told you guys I would tell you a scary story about a bear, so I, I, I promise I will, okay? So this has nothing to do with weeds, but it's still a great story. Um, it was about four or five years ago, um, I got called out to the Broadmoor area, and there was a sow and two cubs that were getting into some trash cans in the middle of the day, and I was the only officer on that day. Realized she needed to be relocated, but I had to get the cubs as well, and I only had one other person with me, and that was a CSPD officer. And so um, we have to get her up into a tree in order to tranquilize her. So I loaded my gun up with rubber buckshot, and I was approaching her. She sent the cubs flying up the tree, which was fantastic. But I was like, okay, I got to get her up the tree. So I just kept going towards her and yelling at her to try to go up the tree, and she decided to charge me. Um, <laughs> okay, mind you, this is in the middle of the city. This is in the Broadmoor area. I backpedaled as fast as I could and shot her in the rear end. And she took off up the tree, and I turned around, looked behind me at the CSPD officer, and he was like, yeah, I went and got my gun. I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. So what kind of questions do we have? There are so many different effects that weeds can have on wildlife. I talked about bears and bears alone because that is the one thing that I deal with constantly. But it can have effects on any type of wildlife. Anything that is grazing out there, the deer, the elk, Yes, they're still feeding off your crops, I understand, um, and I hear that all the time. But it is also going to affect them in their native states. 